said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's not often that you'll hear the words money and heart in the same phrase um, or even the same sentence. Uh, but I'm going to try and attempt to do a talk on this topic. Um, so I'll start with the story. And the story is about Kanti Kaka there. Uh, he's a gentleman right in the center of that picture. Kanti Kaka was 92 when this picture was taken. Um, and in the 1940s, he was part of the independence movement in India. And as you can imagine, the independence movement left a lasting impression on his soul. Um, and so as soon as you know, Indep India re received its independence, he said, you know, independence is not enough. There's a lot more work that, that needs to be done with communities all over India. And so with his brother Vasant, he decided to move from Mumbai to a small village in the middle of Gujarat. Um, and for the last 60 or 70 years, Vasant and Kanti Kaka have lived in this community and worked with the people around them, um, covering all kinds of issues like sanitation, healthcare, food, farming, food systems. And it's pretty incredible because they've built an entire living, thriving ecosystem around them and a self-sustaining ecosystem. So obviously for a volunteer like me, um, in, it, it was a fantastic opportunity to go and explore this new system. So I had, the, I had the privilege of spending a few days with Vasant and Kanti Kaka. Um, and while I was there for those few days, I had some interesting conversations with Kanti Kaka. And it was after one of these conversations on one evening that Kanti Kaka comes over to me and hands me this beautiful white khadi kurta. And inquiring a little more, I found out that Kanti Kaka had actually spun the yarn for this kurta himself. So even at the age of 92, he used to spin his little charkha, his spinning wheel. Um, and the yarn for this kurta came from his spinning. Now that was deeply moving for me. Um, because here I was, and as a banker, I said, you know, look at his possessions, look at his assets. Um, it's a, you know, all he has is a farm, uh, and he has a little charkha, and he's been spinning away at the age of 92. But he's been able to create and spark off a little revolution inside him, the people around him, and even transform people like me who ended up coming and visiting their center. And that made me think very deeply. And so obviously from my introduction, you know, I've been through all kinds of, um, all kinds of, spec all kinds of experiences, from the trading floor to running a gift economy enterprise myself in the ashram. For me, there's always been a deep exploration with wealth, with money, with assets. You know, what meaning does it have in life? Um, from, you know, ex radical experiments of reducing my economic footprint and trying to live on as few possessions as possible, to going out on walks and pilgrimages, you know, trying to see where, how far we can get without money. It's been pretty radical. I'm not here to talk about those experiences, but what they did leave me with was a thought process on my possessions, my assets, and what role they played in my life. And at the end of all of this, I realized I was deeply passionate about writing, speaking about money, working with people all over the world about this. And so the assets that I really needed was a laptop, a traveling budget, and an office to create magic out of. And so a couple of years ago, the, the sacred capital was born. And as we started these conversations with people around money, around wealth, we, f we realized, you know what? Everyone's thinking about money and wealth in this way. Everyone, almost people, I mean, people all over the world have opened up and grown up into, this, into these individuals who, has, who have very conscious choices and opinions about what the world should be. But the current systems felt like they were holding them back. The only option available to individuals was to go over to that bank or go over to that fund manager and say, here, I hand over my money to you. I don't really have a, you know, have a choice, but I have to hand it over to you. And that's what people felt like. They felt held back by these systems. Um, and more importantly, it was almost like this was the most secure option for individuals, for not only their security, but for their loved ones. And so it was almost like this sense of helplessness. But a few interesting things have started happening over the last few years. Um, some of those secure options aren't really secure anymore. Uh, 2016 was one of those years. Um, I think we've all lived through and come out of it asking what, what happened in that year. Um, and in 2016, we saw 
that geopolitical uncertainty revolution wasn't just limited to emerging markets and, and developing nations, but it was spreading out all over the world across the US, the UK, Europe. And so all of a sudden, um, paradigms for risk, return, financial planning were, start, were needed to change. In fact, you know, something as simple as earning interest from a bank wasn't as simple anymore because interest rates across the world have just started to drop and some countries have actually become negative. And so all of a sudden, everyone's scrambling because these, what we thought was secure, what we thought was the norm, is starting to get questioned. And so financial planning, investment advisory, risk return, asset allocation, all of these terms have needed a redefinition. Uh, and to add to all of this chaos, we've had technology playing a pretty interesting role, um, where two entrepreneurs or two technologists sitting out of a garage could potentially disrupt a 100-year-old organization. Um, thousands and millions of people across the world feeling redundancy because an algorithm could probably be doing what they're doing. And all of this has led to a certain amount of chaos and questioning. And it's interesting because within that chaos, technology started to play a very, very interesting role. Um, over the last few years, some of you might have heard about fintech, financial technology, the revolution that it's created. More importantly, what it started to spark off is a whole new realm of opportunities for people. So instead of being limited to that bank or financial institution, we've seen paradigms where you, know, you can go and make a payment to another person without having to go to a bank. Initiatives like crowdfunding, initiatives like equity crowd raising, peer-to-peer -peer lending are starting to initiate paradigms where if there's an entrepreneur or a change maker in some part of the world, he doesn't have to be limited to a large funder or he doesn't have to be limited to a large donor or an investor. He can actually garner the support of his own community and create magic from wherever he is in the world. And so all of a sudden, because of these innovations, because of some of the technologies we spoke about, like blockchain technology, distri distributed ledger technology, these kinds of paradigms are becoming extremely simple, transparent, and robust. And so that means exactly what I said. From all parts of the world, we're starting to see these beautiful innovations come alive. Traditionally, um, if I had to access public capital, I'd have to go to a stock exchange. I'd have to be a $100 million company. But now we're starting to see you know, someone as small as a home chef, someone as small as a school teacher with an, with an idea, with an initiative, starting to garner the power of his or her community. And that's the peer-to-peer -peer paradigm that's coming alive. So what does that mean? All of a sudden, instead of just being limited to that bank deposit um, in your neighborhood, you could be thinking about low-cost interest loans to a farmer in Asia. You could be thinking about extending a loan to that coffee shop, that fair trade organic coffee shop that you visited last year in California that you really follow. Um, it could be in include funding that co-working space that you want to go and work at six months down the line. So there's these whole new options that have started to emerge, and they've created a shift. And that means as this asset universe starts to expand, like I said, the old approach of handing over your money to a financial planner or a fund manager is changing. Now, this is not a paradigm that's alien to us. We've seen this in music. We've seen this in media. In music, I mean, as a kid growing up in the 90s, my universe of music was all the CDs that were in the store and that street and that shop down the road. In media, I mean, all the news that I had access to was from the newspaper that was dropped outside my doorstep. But all of a sudden, I'm looking at millions and billions of opinions and, and viewpoints through my Instagram feed. I'm looking at millions or billions of songs through my smartphone. And so there's a huge shift and that similar shift is playing out in the world of finance as well. And so we actually believe, and what we're seeing is a shift from asset management to what is known as asset curation. So from those millions and billions of assets that are potentially being created out there, the question is, what do you resonate with? And that involves you taking a from far more active stance and saying, this is what I'd like to do. This is who I, this is what I represent. And so it could mean participating in the profits of that renewable energy project. It could mean funding that filmmaker who's making that documentary and the cause you really support. It could mean investing in a company that's trying to solve the food problem across the world. The options are literally endless. And all of this begins when you start thinking about making that shift away from a passive approach. For example, in your day, you might be going around you know, making certain decisions like 
Should your coffee be organic or not? Should your clothes be a certain type or not? Should you f go to a store which follows fair wages and fair trade or not? But with our wealth, we've always had to follow a passive approach. But now that's changing. Now the opportunity is there for us to actually actively engage. And that only begins when you say, I want to put my money where my heart is. And so when you put your money where your heart is, all of these options start opening up. And that's the power of asset curation. And that's the power of what technology is enabling for us. And so to close, I'll, I'd like to bring Kanti Kaka back into the presentation. Um, his spinning wheel or his charkha was a beautiful example of social justice. Um, because no matter who you are, no matter what your net worth is, you know, how rich you were, with the charkha you could spark off a revolution in yourself, in your community, in the people around you. You didn't have to wait for large institutions, you didn't have to wait for governments to make change. All you had to do was step up and drive that change yourself. And I think that same paradigm is playing out in finance. When you make that shift from asset management to asset curation, you're saying, I, have, I want to play an active role. I want to actually voice my opinion on what, uh, what my assets should be. And in doing so, you start shaping the social fabric of the world around you, irrespective of what your net worth is, irrespective of what, of what your wealth might be, you, have, you start having a say. And all of that only begins when you put your money where your heart is. Because I believe that's the path to a more beautiful and more socially just world. So thank you.